Great Pony, without further ado, we would like to introduce the creator of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Lauren Faust! gift, we have Inky Notebook to present a special project of hers. I guess I'll come over here. Hi, every pony. I am <laughs> uh, I'm Inky Notebook, and I'm hosting the Traveling Pony Museum. Um, a few months ago, I started a project within the community called uh, Dear Princess Celestia. And the concept was that you wrote a letter as if you were writing to Princess Celestia. So the beginning of the letter had to say, Dear Princess Celestia. You wrote about what you've learned and what this show has given you and what you've taken from it. And you end with your faithful student, signed by your pony son in name. And um, I added a twist to it. Uh, instead of writing to Princess Celestia, you're writing to Lauren Faust. And um, I've gotten hundreds of letters in from people all over the globe, um, from anywhere from Indonesia to Europe to uh, the USS Defender stationed outside of Japan. Um, this project has gone far and wide, and we'd actually like to read a short excerpt from one of the most touching letters in the book to you. So, we'll take out the letter. Yeah, it's earlier on. Sorry, one second. <laughs> ah. So we received this very interesting letter. Uh, it had a cover letter, a one-page short version, and a seven-page full version. Um, they didn't believe that their seven-page version uh, would work in the book. And it's actually been one of the most touching letters that I've read. I read through them for quality control and content. And um, this letter actually inspired me to keep going on my project. Uh, is this better? Okay, so we're going to read this letter. Uh, this is one of the most inspirational letters that I received uh, that helped me continue my project. Um, it is a long and spiraling series of events that nearly brought about my ruin. I entered university in my 18th year as both a cadet and midshipman at a very well thought of ROTC program. Nothing suggested to me to be out of the ordinary, but that I had the keener eyes of age to know what to look for. It is true that we impact others' lives was no secret to me, but I had known the reverse was true, and that the company we keep has just as prized found an impact on ours. I would have been more discriminatory in my choosing of friends. Also, it must be said that the environs I lived in had a toxic effect on me, though again, I was ignorant of that until nearly too late. And now brings me to the crux of my narrative and to the eventful road of recovery of this cheering and careful lad I had grown up as. It is stood that I was damaged, every good relationship I had once held dear was gaining weight at an alarming rate, and though once a varsity athlete could not run for more than two miles without a good wheezing fit. My anger and bitterness drove me to find refuge in the bars until the early hours of the morning, and only served to deepen the hole of hate I had firmly and defiantly set myself into. At some point, I realized I could no longer see the light of day, and the whole of bitterness began to feel like my own grave. It was only a matter of the time before I was swallowed forever and lose sight of what really mattered in life. I did seek the help of a therapist and tried multiple times to give up my vices and found that neither course resulted in any success. The letter continues to go on to talk about how he had dove into alcohol and drugs and was ruining his family, you know, ruining his relationship with his family and even his girlfriend. And at the end of the letter, um, he reveals that not only through My Little Pony and watching the show, he was able to come out and re, you know, reform those relationships, and now he's even considering marriage with his now you know, future wife.
So we'd like to present these letters to you, Ms. Lauren Faust, as a thank you for all you've done for us in this community. All the original envelopes have been kept, too, with all their addresses, and there's even artwork. We encourage people to draw and, and be creative in this. Now, if I heard correctly, that letter was from a military brony. Do we have any military bronies here today? One thing we were talking about right before this panel when I was speaking to Lauren was about how important it is that there are military bronies out there, guys in uniform who are serving their country, but also fans of the show. So I think we de they deserve a round of applause. All right. Well, so Lauren Faust, how are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. <laughs> okay, so because we are limited on time, I'm gonna get right to it. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you was a very general question, and it's something I think everybody is, is interested in, which is where did you get the general premise, the general idea for what you wanted to do with My Little Pony? What were your inspirations? What were your influences? Uh, well, my biggest inspirations were uh, the way that I played with these toys when I was a little girl. Um, my Little Pony was actually my favorite toy. Um, I started collecting them when I was six, and I stopped very reluctantly when I was 12. <laughs> uh, and there was a very specific way that I played with them, the kind of stories I told with them, the kind of personalities that I gave them, uh, it very much shaped the way I think as a storyteller. And um, I, I always said that um, I consulted my inner eight-year-old while I was developing this show. Well, I think it's true with any kid's show, or really any kid's media, that a narrative is really the focus. It's not necessarily flashy action. Yes. It's really the characters and just the stories that their trials and tribulations that you know, the focus is. I kind of wanted to ask you then, coming from that background, you developed this show, this newer incarnation of Pony, and you based it around six main characters, and that must have been a conscientious choice. Why did you six, choose six main characters, and what about them each did you want to instill? What values did you want to instill into them? Uh, well, you know, the first thing I thought, again, thinking about the way I played with the toys when I was a kid, um, was that I wanted the show to be about uh, an ensemble cast rather than focusing on one character and her perspective. Um, and I had a lot of experience doing uh, ensemble cast comedies coming off Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Uh, I, when I first, thank you. I think that's worthy of a round of applause, yeah. Uh, when I first sat down and came up with the most broad stroke based concept that I wanted to pitch to Hasbro, and this, this was actually just to secure the job, uh, I went into my toy collection. I have all my ponies from when I was a little girl, and I picked out six toys that I played with the most when I was a kid, and I tried really hard to remember what personalities I gave those six. Um, and the other thing that I was searching for, even when I was looking at my toys, was, you know, this is a show for girls. Um, most shows for girls, aimed at girls, targeting girls, um, have the same character over and over and over again. And other shows that consider themselves gender neutral are for boys. If you're lucky, they've got one girl. And she's got to encompass everything that is female in the world. I had six girls, and I wanted any girl, anybody who watched this show to be able to find uh, someone to relate to. So I was looking for characters that I called at the time like icons of girliness, and I was looking through my toy collection to find those icons, the tomboy, the debutante, the bookworm, the waif, the, you know, the, um, that's, that's what I wanted. I wanted to have somebody there who represented an aspect of, I think, what a, what a lot of girls uh, uh, feel in their life and in their childhood. 
Well, and you know, I think that you did that really well. And of course, you. you came up with the uh, the elements of harmony. You yes. got you know honesty, loyalty, generosity, laughter, kindness, and magic. One thing I thought that was really interesting is that Twilight Sparkle, as her character, is an unusual type of character in a girl's show. She's intelligent. She's bookish. Yes. You know, and, and I think that in a sense, you almost are teaching girls and really fans of the show that intelligence can be magic. You know, and I think that that's really resonated with the internet as a whole. And so I just wanted to see if that was something you conscientiously did to try and break that stereotype, to create a character who's a little bit more, well, adorkable. You know, it wasn't something I was doing to break a stereotype. Um, I was looking for relatable characters, and I relate to this character. I think we've all known the girl who really wants to get good grades. Um, usually that girl is shown as a stick in the mud, or, uh, you know, a, a nerd, or, um, you know, unattractive even. And, but I never knew anybody who was like that. I knew a lot of girls who were pretty and smart and nice, and we're really concerned about getting good grades. I was, even very specifically, uh, my own mother was that way. She was too busy studying to make friends. And I've encountered that icon so much in my life, it, it just seemed natural to me to, to include that in the group. I, I didn't even think, it, I wasn't even searching for her. She was just there. Well, I think that the, one of the other reasons why this show is so popular and it resonates with people is that you, you have that ensemble cast. Everybody can resonate with at least one of those characters, if not two. Everybody has a favorite pony. And I also think the other reason why this show has gotten such a resonance in, in culture is because there is clearly an overall morality to it. And I was wondering if you could speak to the overarching moral theme you wanted to present when you were coming up with this idea. Um, when I first started developing, um, I knew I wanted an ensemble cast. I knew that I wanted, I, I knew that I wanted it to reflect the kinds of relationships girls have with their friends when they're that age, when they're young. Uh, anywhere from when they're a little girl, even until they're teenagers. Uh, memories that I had of, of being with my own friends. Um, and, uh... Sorry, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Well, um, I think that the, you know it's kind of a large thought, really. It's, yes. it's hard to focus such a large concept in a lot of ways. Well, one thing though, with your philosophy towards the show, it seems to me that you're trying to accomplish something. You're trying to change what kids shows could accomplish, and yes. especially, especially girls' show. Yeah. What were you specifically trying to accomplish with this incarnation of My Little Pony? Um, I think the only thing I did that was a little a little revolutionary was that I, I didn't go, this is a show for girls, what do I have to do differently? I, I was trained and experienced in telling good stories and making entertaining television. And I think a lot of people when they make shows for girls go, they turn to market research, they turn to stereotypes, they, they come from a place of observation rather than from the inside and being a girl and knowing girls and thinking of girl experiences. I wanted a respectable show for girls because, you know, saying something is for girls or girly is usually equated with being um, not worthwhile, of being lame, of being stupid. And I wanted to put a dent in that perception. I think you did that. Thank you. And I think the 4,000 people here and the several thousand that are watching online live right now would be absolute proof of that fact. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I personally, I personally think that the Brony movement is a direct consequence of your vision for the show. And I think the Brony movement is redefining gender stereotypes in society. Yes. So, <laughs> so you are responsible, I think, and I think just about everybody here will agree with this, for social change. Maybe a little, but I, oh, it's hard to take that kind of credit, but I, I hope it's a start. I hope it's a start. 
Well, so going into the specifics of how you brought about this incarnation of the show, I wanted to go to your artistic influences because this generation of Pony looks a lot different than the hippopotamuses <laughs> of Gen 3 or, or, or earlier. Um, what did you specifically do in the design of the characters and the artistic look to kind of give them that, that different, flashier, more colorful appearance? You know, again, it wasn't something I sat down and really planned. It's just the way I draw. Um, I, I have been drawing horses since I can remember, and I have been drawing cute things since I can remember, and I just kind of mashed them together as best I could. I just wanted them to be appealing. I wanted them to move and look like, you know, or, or at least evoke the feeling of a natural horse and not like a person in a costume walking on four legs. Um, uh, I was really searching for making something insanely, insanely cute. <laughs> I think you accomplished that as well. Thank you. Can you name any specific artistic influences on your style that has translated not only into what you're doing with, or what you had done with My Little Pony, but also with Powerpuff Girls, Foster's Home, and your newer projects, which we can go into in a minute, but are there any specific artists or any specific animations that really influenced you? Yeah, well, you know, I, I started working in animation uh, out of a love, a sincere love for classic Disney movies. Um, uh, not just the way I draw, but the kind of stories I like to tell come very much from how obsessed I was with those as a child. Um, however, I loved all cartoons. I, I, I'd have to admit that, you know, Warner Brothers, classic Warner Brothers animation is a huge influence. Um, I, my very first animation job on a movie called Cats Don't Dance um, had uh, wonderful, appealing character designs, and I was only 21 when I got that job. I did a lot of learning, and I think a lot of the design elements that I do in my current artwork carry over from how much I learned on that film. And then, of course, you know, meeting my husband and getting to work on Powerpuff Girls, I, there's no way that that wouldn't leak its way into, into my design style as well. Well, and it cer certainly is a very distinctive style, both Powerpuff Girls and, you know, My Little Pony. And I think that all the artists that are here that have, you know, tried to capture a little bit, a little essence of that style really can credit it to what you've done to, you know, create that new type of style, because it is a new type of style. Yeah. And it seems that it has almost uh, some even anime elements to it, too. Yeah. Um, are there any anime <laughs> fans in the audience here? <laughs> okay, so just one or two, just one or two. <laughs> are there any specific, you know, and, and this is something that I think is kind of interesting about the show, and I've heard a lot of people say this, is that you managed to make, in a lot of senses, a western eye, it's not an anime per se, but a anime-inspired western show. And I wanted to know if there was a specific type of anime or film that you have seen that may have been that influence. You know, I, I, can't, I can't say so, I, I, except for, you know, the obvious influence of, you know, the transformation sequence kind of stuff that happened in the pilot. Um, you know, the world is getting smaller, and and everything you see influences you. I think you know, if, if you look into the history of um, Japanese animation, you know, so much of the, the 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 style that we all associate with Japan comes from Tezuka. And when you do a little research in the history of Tezuka, you find out he was trying to draw like Walt Disney, and so. West influence East and East influence West again. I, I can't say I looked at anime and said, I'm going to do that. And, you know, when my husband Craig talks about the Powerpuff Girls, he'll say the same thing. He was making, everyone thinks the Powerpuff Girls look like, uh, you know, chibi, super deformed anime characters. He was influenced by keen paintings from the 60s, which was from, you know, North America. 
So I think those kind of influences just sneak into our brain. And, you know, uh, this was also a collaborative effort. And, you know, the animators watch what they uh, uh, watch, the directors watch what they watch. And, and it's a collective artistic community, and we all influence each other. Well, the next question then is kind of an interesting one. And I think it's something that, that people occasionally hear about but don't really know too much about, which is that. Your original vision for the show, the artistic style was carried through, but there were specific little details that were changed. Yeah. Um, maybe you could share a couple of those details that didn't follow through to the final version. I mean, obviously the current version is amazing and we all love it, but there were, you know, say names that were different or, you know, species that were different. Yeah. Uh, can you give a few uh, little nuggets out there for the audience? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, Making a television show is an organic process, and you might sit down with a, with a specific plan of a path you want to follow, but once you get on that path and you start working with other people, you deviate and you take things in other directions. And then you also run into things like standards and practices and legal and all that sort of stuff. But we had a lot of characters that had their names changed. Um, uh, Apple Bloom was originally Apple Seed, and she was originally had uh, the only crusader. In fact, there were no crusaders originally. I was asked to include Sweetie Belle and Scootaloo, and I had to create the Cutie Mark Crusaders after the fact. Um, Big Macintosh was originally Big Apple, and he uh, ran uh, Big Apple Acres, or Big Apple Orchard, actually. Did he have a New York accent? He did not. The yup and nope thing, that was always there. <laughs> I think Peter Nooch uh, proved today that, that he could have. <laughs> yes, I'm sure he could have. Um, uh, Zakora was originally named Shaman. That didn't go uh, through legal. And she was originally supposed to play a little bit of a larger role in the series. She was supposed to be kind of a mentor character to Twilight. And it wasn't that we said, no, forget it, and threw the idea, uh, the idea out. It's just the stories we were exploring it just kind of didn't come up. And we did bridal gossip to introduce her with the intention of making her this mentor sort of character, specifically when the characters went off on adventures and they needed a character who could give them information about a new monster or a new place that they were going, that she'd be this great device to get that exposition out as quickly as possible. And it just that role just didn't seem to, to hash out for her. Um, Ponyville was originally called Philadelphia. <laughs> that's that's why right. I'm was glad that we could come back around and use that again. But that was Ponyville's original name. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, Rarity originally I wanted her to have a British accent, <laughs> but it was fake. It was always fake. Um, she was faking that to try to look more sophisticated. Um, that's all that comes to mind right now. Well, and of course, as a, uh, as a brony out there, I know that a lot of people who have, are hearing this now are then going to go back and try and portray Rarity that way. And one <laughs> thing I thought that you mentioned uh, earlier before the panel to me that I think is kind of important for people to understand is that although you had the creative vision for the show, there were the differences when it came out. And also that, you know, not everything, not every little detail was planned in advance. Yeah. That, you know, oh, definitely not. Would you say then that as the episodes came out, you know, how much of that was, obviously in terms of writing, it was pre-planned and anime, but in terms of, you started out with what a lot of people refer to as the Bible of yes. the show. How in-depth was that Bible and how adaptable was it after you came out with it? Uh, well, an animation Bible is a actual, like, um, tool that it's a, it's an, it, that's an industry term, Bible, and it is a tool that we all begin with when we, when we start new shows. It's, for, it's reference for everybody who's working on the show. And they are all by nature flexible. This is our starting point. Again, you know, it's an organic process and you, you learn things as you go, you change your mind as you go, uh, new people bring new things to the table, so it's, it's always flexible. But I wanted to, you know, I wrote an unusually large Bible. It was 40 pages, uh, writing and illustration. Um, but that was mostly just because I really, I just wanted to sell it so bad. I just didn't want to leave anything up to the imagination. <laughs> because, you know, I have this term that, like, you know, sometimes you'll get things rejected because somebody imagined it poorly. You know, I call it taking it to Stupidville. And you, you pitch something, 
And then they go, why would you want to do that? That's stupid. And you're like, you're imagining it's stupid. I'm not going to do it stupid. Um, so I, I go overboard and I fill in lots of information. It was, it was pretty in depth and there's, there's um, you know, if I look back at it, I can only say maybe only 15, 20% of it maybe might be altered from, from the original Bible. Well, so then with that in mind, because I think a lot of people out there who, you know, have questions, have questions about, say, specific episodes, specific concepts, you know, I, I heard that on another panel you were asked about, you know, the origins of Discord or the origins of, of Celestia and Luna, and I was wondering if you could kind of talk about how you approach that kind of a question, you know, how do you, what, what's your answer to that sort of specific, you know, concept? Well, you know, we... Again, because it's an organic process, you know, I think a lot of creators sit down and they plan out their world and they plan out the arc of what they want to do and where they want to go. But in order to honor that organic process, I don't like to tie anything down unless it's in an episode. Um, so like questions like, you know, who are Celestia's and Luna's parents? I don't know, it, it didn't come up. If it did come up, we would figure it out then. And there's a few things here and there that, you know, I might have started with an idea, like, you know, certain characters had things that they wanted and, and fates that were supposed to come to pass. And I wanted to work my way there. So, like, while we were writing the show, I would plant little seeds of, like, oh, maybe later if we want to do an episode where, you know, Twilight and Trixie battle it out again. I want to make sure to leave that door open. I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> um, I, so I would always look to make sure that doors like that were open and that we weren't defining things that we didn't want to ruin later. Like I remember once in the very early episode, uh, a storyboard artist wanted to show Rainbow Dash flying with a rainbow streak behind her, and I was like, no, take that out, because I want to do that later. Um, but really, there's, there's, there's not a lot, because I want to make sure to tie it down when we get the opportunity. So if it's not in the show, I don't really have an answer of what happened before or what's going to happen later. It's, it's defined in the writer room at the time, and it isn't, it isn't canon until it's on the screen. So would you say then that My Little Pony Friendship and Magic is not predestined? That maybe there's still story yet to tell? Oh, definitely. I, and I wanted it to be that way. Well, I think it, obviously, you know, the vision that you've had for it has really carried over very well. But you also have vision for a few other new shows that are going to be coming out and a couple projects you've been working on. Uh, one of those is Galaxy Girls. Can you give us... Uh, Can you give us a little bit of uh, maybe background on you know the Galaxy Girls idea and where it's at right now? Sure. Well, Galaxy Girls is a, a line of dolls I created uh, several years ago. Um, it was intended to be a toy line. I never really thought it would make a really great television show, but like every time I pitched it around, everybody wanted it to be a television show. Um, and up, you know. It is, up until My Little Pony, it was like the bane of my existence that it was really hard to pitch shows for girls, especially if the, all the characters were girls. Uh, that was one of the reasons I wanted it to just be toys. Um, Galaxy Girls is, I like to say they're in stasis right now. We, I, I don't want to do it until I can do it right. So we're looking for the right partner, someone who has the right kind of funding and is going to share my vision, I would rather wait until I can make it as good as possible than get it out there really fast and have it not live up to its, its potential. So we're looking for partners. We've actually talked to someone recently that has potential, but if anything comes of it, especially in terms of media. It, it might be a little while yet, but I don't, I don't want to ruin it, so I'm, I'm waiting until I can do it right. And it really seems like that was kind of the approach you took with uh, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic as well. It seems like your goal is to create a setup where it has the, uh, really the resources and the openness for that creativity to 
develop organically. In this oh, community. definitely. Like when, when I was doing it, every step that I took before it got, you know, before I signed my contract, you know, I just kept going. At any point now, this is going to go sour. I better enjoy it while it lasts. And I remember, like, every step that I turned something in or did a pitch, I was like, this is the last time. It's going to turn stupid after this. It's going to get stupid after this one. And it, it just, it just, it never did. Well, you also have another show that you're working on, on the DC network, uh, Super Best Friends Forever. Yes. And, and it's got an, an acronym, I think. <laughs> it's got what? It's got an acronym, I think. Yes. Yes, SBFF. Um, SBFF, Super Best Friends Forever, airs on Cartoon Network in the DC Nation block. Um, four have aired already. We got one left to go. Um, I don't know the air day yet, but if you follow my DeviantArt site, I'll announce it as soon as I find out. But uh, yeah, it's the adventures of best friends, uh, Batgirl, Supergirl, Wonder Girl, uh, told from a comedic perspective. They're super short, but uh, they, were, they were a blast to make. I'm really happy with them. Well, and speaking of, you know, how small the world is becoming, welcome to Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> I think just about everybody here is already following you. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm guilty of that as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, and I wanted to say, you know, I think that, that Twitter and some of these social media networks and, and you know, just the general interactivity with the, the cast and crew in a lot of ways, you kind of started that in a sense with your DeviantArt posts. And I think a lot of us who, you know, became bronies, say, last year, you know, really followed what you had to say on DeviantArt. And, and you have a bold, you know, a bold way of responding to criticism that I think we all <laughs> respect. So <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, give you credit there for oh, that. Oh, thank you. I thought I was worried I was getting bad for a while. I've kind of cut my, shut my trap for a while there. <laughs> <laughs> no, never do that. <laughs> Well, okay, so you've got another project coming up here. Yes. I don't know if anybody knows about this yet. No, they might not. Um, and you tell me that it's called Wonder Yonder. Wander Over Yonder. Wander Over Yonder. And maybe, yes. and, and not only that, you are going to be talking a little bit more of it later this summer at Comic-Con? Yes. I'm, I'm uh, right now working again with my husband, Craig McCracken. And... We're, uh, we're teaming up again, uh, producing a new show Craig created, Wander Over Yonder. It'll be airing on the Disney Channel. Uh, uh, Disney, we're working for T Disney TV Animation, and we'll be making a big announcement uh, about it at uh, San Diego Comic-Con, uh, what, the second weekend in July? Is there any, anything you can tell them about what the show's gonna be about, just a general idea? Very generally, it's a surrealistic, fantastical space adventure comedy. <laughs> Works for me. Well, so before we get to the audience questions, I wanted to ask you one last question about the approach to the show, to My Little Pony specifically, and really, I guess, to the approach to all of your animation projects, which is, it seems like in My Little Pony and in your other shows, there are character-driven episodes and there are adventure-driven episodes. And yeah. sometimes, you know, episodes will lean one way or another. When you create a series like Wander Over Yonder or Galaxy Girls, are you more driven by that character element or by an overarching kind of adventure element? Oh, I'm, I'm much more drawn to character. I, I literally think it's kind of what I do. Um, I think great story comes from the characters. I think great comedy comes from the characters. And even when I do try write or develop adventure stories, that the adventure that they're going on is about them. And the outside conflict that they're dealing with, the adventure is a reflection of a, a characteristic they have, a, 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 a personal problem that they're having to get over. My personal belief is that, that, that that's what makes great story. Um, and I think that's what makes people uh, connect to shows and fall in love with the shows. Well, and would that be why, you know, your series that you have, you know, the, the Galaxy Girls, the Super Best Friends Forever, they tend to be these ensemble casts. Yes, 
would you say that there are direct parallels between some of the characters, say, between, I don't know, Batgirl and Applejack at times? Or? Oh, yeah. Well, I can't say that I do that on purpose, but I think, you know, I'd be ridiculous to try to pretend that Batgirl isn't like Pinkie Pie, isn't like Bubbles. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's differences, and I could argue for hours about what those differences are, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a style thing, and you know, I think if you read several books from the same author, you're going to see similarities, and you know, and this, this is because that, you know, I think with any creator, your characters and your stories are coming from your heart and coming from inside you, and you know, the same sort of experiences, the same sort of humor, um, different shades of that. Uh, I think come through, and I, I don't. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. <laughs> um, well, so do we have some audience questions? All right, we've got some audience questions here, real quick. So I will. Testing. Good. Actually, everyone, we already chose our questions, so. Yeah, guys, the questions have been pre-screened. Given the lack of time, we've only got a time for a couple of them. So if you don't get your question in, I hi, apologize. Mrs. Faust. Hello. Uh, what, thank you for showing up to BronyCon. We're all really excited to see you here. It's my you know, pleasure. It's, it's been great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Um, my question to you is, now that you've seen the size, the depth, and the potential in the My Little Pony fandom here at BronyCon, the largest BronyCon to date, my question to you is, what do you take back from this experience from all of us here, and how will it affect your future projects? Um, you know what, this is going to sound cheesy, but it's really renewed my faith in people, you know? You know, I, I never dreamed that, uh, you, you know, the, the, the most notable part of the Brony community that everybody likes to point out is adult men, and I never dreamed adult men would be into this show because I didn't have any faith that you'd give it a try. And now I know better, and I'm, it gives me the courage to continue, um, you know, and to think that, you know, I'm a... I like girly stuff, and you know it's it's hard to get it made out there. But now I've got something to point to to go like, look, people like it. People people will watch it if it's good. People aren't all just sexist jerks. <laughs> <laughs> and I do want to let you know, and I've just been told this by my production director, One Trick, that you see this crowd in front of you. There is an equal number, 3,500 people right now watching online. Holy moly! So. So that fan base, imagine this doubled at least. Oh boy, yeah, no pressure, thanks. <laughs> None at all. <laughs> Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Hello, my name is Lukas, and I came here from our Poland, all the oh, way. Oh, awesome. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, how do you find that Brony is not only US, but it's worldwide phenomenon? Uh, what did he say? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, how do you find that the uh, Brony phenomenon is worldwide, not only U.S.? Yes. It, are you saying that it is worldwide? How, how do you find it? How, how, why do I think it's... How do you feel about the Brony phenomenon outside of the United States? Um, amazing. <laughs> there are a lot of international <laughs> Bronies here today. I think a round of applause for those people who came from overseas. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. What am I gonna say? I hate it. It's it's wonderful. It's it's a it's a dream come true. I just wanna say you have uh, over 2,000 uh, Brony fans in Poland, and everybody say hi. Thank you. I'm a quarter Polish. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> proud. <laughs> Hello there, Mrs. Faust. Hello. I am Andrew, and my question is, well, first of all. 
let's get all the you're amazing, I love you out of the way. You're amazing and I love you. Thank you. I think that's the entire audience here. <laughs> Touche. Um, I'd like to ask um, if this grony phenomena hadn't happened, I'm pretty sure it's impacted your life fairly, you know, hard. Um, how do you think your life would have been like today if nothing had become of this? Um, I'd just be working. <laughs> um, y you know, that's, that's so hard to say. Um, uh, I, I think I would just keep on keeping on the path I was in. I, I'd probably still be working towards trying to make something good for girls. I mean, uh, actually having done it makes a huge difference, so maybe I'd be a lot more frustrated than I am now. <laughs> it's nice to have a little success behind you. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that you succeeded. Am I right? Or am I right? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Miss Faust. Hello. Um, I'm Rabbi. Hello again. Um, the first, one of the things I find most amazing about the show is the fact that not only is its uh, target demographic completely different from most of the people here, and not only can you have songs in it that are really good and all of that, but you also, it was an educational show. It was in the educational bracket and you had lessons at the end of each show pretty explicitly stated. And some of them are pretty straightforward and some of them are kind of controversial. Um, was there one that you liked in particular or one that you thought was very important? Uh, one of those lessons, letters to Celestia at the end. You know, this is gonna sound silly and maybe it's not for the reason that you're looking for, but I was really uh, happy with Suited for Success. And That's my favorite episode. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, I don't know if many artists get to literally make a commentary on how frustrating notes are. <laughs> or how frustrating notes can be. And it's not so much the message at the end of it because, you know, God, as an artist, wouldn't we all dream to have Rarity's ending where all the people who were messing up your stuff went, you know what, you were right, just do it the way you were doing it. Um, but it's a, a beautiful dream, I hope, comes true someday for me. <laughs> That's fantastic. I've Thank converted you. all of my designer friends using that episode. So. Oh, really? It's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's like the anthem of the, of the freelance artist. It's just, we, we were having so much fun in the room going like, oh, I had this guy tell me this once. I'll make Twilight like that. It was, it was really funny. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Miss Faust, we apparently have a little bit of a surprise for you at the end here. Uh -oh. Is uh, is Zephyr here or is Fulner here? Are you guys around here somewhere? I'm told you're here somewhere. They're on their way? Okay. Had to fill up some well, time. <laughs> while they're on their way, I'll just make a comment that, yeah, everyone I've talked to who's been in a creative position has really resonated with that episode. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Exactly. Plus, I got to draw dresses. <laughs> <laughs> Which is every cartoonist dream, correct? Well, maybe every girl cartoonist. <laughs> are we close? Are they nearby? Do we know? Maybe I have, a maybe I have time for one more question I can ask. OK. Um, well, so I guess overall, given you know, the success of Pony, and given, you know, and you, you say that it's every artist's dream, in a sense, to have everybody tell you at the end, you were right. <laughs> this is an entire crowd of people saying that right now. Uh... You were right. <laughs> and... <laughs> well, I guess I can die now. <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> I think we all want you to be right again. <laughs> I'd love to be. 
So at least for me and for my, I know everyone I've ever spoken to, we want to thank you for the work that you've done on not only in this series but on your other series, and you know wish you all the best in you know in your new series coming up here. Thank you so so much. Well, okay, so. So for those of you out there who might be in the way of one Mr. Fulner or one Mr. Zephyr, please get out of their way. Because <laughs> I think they're trying to make it here. Um, you know, is there anything else that you'd like to mention while we wait for them? Um, any, any kind of, you know, snippets you can give them? Any other, like, any changes? Any kind of changes to the show that were made? You know, anything like that? that we, um, to bide the time, you know, just little things. Uh, maybe not changes to the show. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to just repeat what I said earlier today, but I, I just want to thank everyone for being here. Thank everyone for supporting the show. Thank everybody for showing that little girls and the things that they love are worthwhile. You know? I... I think you all are a, a step in the right direction, and I hope that more people choose to follow, not necessarily by watching My Little Pony, but by, you know, uh, you know letting, letting little girls know that they're loved and, and that their interests aren't stupid and that they aren't stupid. Oh, it's here it comes. very important You're... to me. All right. Oh, no. Yeah, it's right here. All right, here's Zephyr and Fulner. Oh my God. Break on staff. You guys ready? How am I going to get that on the plane? I, I'm going to hand you my mic. Say hi to the thousands of people. Everybody, this is Fulner, head of VIP relations with BronyCon. Give him a round of applause. He's done an amazing job. And this here, everybody, is Mr. Zephyr, who is the vice chair of BronyCon. Again, round of applause. Ms. Faust, on behalf of all of the fans for Project Create, which was run by Purple Tinker and the rest, we would like to present you with this gift. Thank you so much. All right. How am I going to get this on the plane? <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, thanks for coming out. And can we get one last round of applause for Lauren Faust? Thank you. Is this thing working? All right. Well, guys, I know they're going to want to clear the area, so please do so in an orderly fashion. And of course, this video, among others, will be posted by this evening on www.everfreeradio.com. Again, thank you so much. <laughs>